Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this Sunday service at the Victoria Centre or Queen's Road Methodist Church. Special welcome to anybody who's visiting us today and to anybody watching online. I have one or two short notices to give. The first one is uh, details of all our Christmas services this week are included in the new sheet. A reminder too that we're hosting the annual Keynesian Brass Band Christmas Concert at Victoria on Monday the 18th, that's tomorrow, at 7.30 p.m. No tickets are needed. We are delighted to be supporting the Jesse May Trust this year with our retiring collection. The next announcement is that on the uh, Christmas Day morning service, uh, there will be a, a retiring collection for Christian aid. There are collection envelopes in the back of the church if you'd like to pick one up on the way out. Uh, if you're not able to um, come to the Christmas service, then you can put the envelopes into the offering at any time. Thank you. Um, our evening, uh, after our service this morning, there will be refreshments served in the hatch. And, uh, and one final notice um, for, for the sake of continuity is that the Advent ring will be lit later in, in the service today, not to start it. I shall have a moment's silence to, re to prepare for the service. And it's my pleasure to welcome Reverend John Tate to lead our service this morning. Thank you, John. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. God's anointed is coming, good news for the world. The broken hearts will beat with strength. The feet in shackles will dance with freedom. The eyes that weep will cry no more, for hope is restored. And today, in this place, we hear heaven's call. The angels proclaiming, the prophets telling, God's anointed is coming, good news for the world. And our voices shall sing, for God's covenant is sure, the promise is forever. God's word is for us. We are ready to hear, to find ourselves in the light that is coming. We join together to praise God as we sing hymn number 172, Hills of the North Rejoice, River and Mountain Spring Hark to the Advent Voice, 172.
we continue on our Advent journey in the strength of hope, celebrating the glimpses of glory in our midst and preparing for the glories to come, following that strange voice crying in the wilderness and acknowledging our own voice crying in our hearts. So, Lord of our journeying, Lord of our crying, meet us in Bethlehem, that we may worship you individually, as a community, as a church, as the world you came to save. We praise and adore you, O God, for your urgency and passion. We thank you for choosing John the Baptizer to be your prophet, and for blessing him with words that stir our hearts and humility that transforms our lives. May we look deep within ourselves and not be afraid to name the good and persevere at the frustrating. Advent God, echoing down the ages with a voice of thunder, thank you for the warning voices who call us back from the brink of danger or destruction and comfort us with the good news of your love and forgiveness. Advent God, the wind of challenge and change, blowing from the desert around us and through us. Thank you for sending those uncomfortable, abrasive people who see through our excuses, confront our complacency and strip away our pretensions. Advent God surging towards us with the sound of many waters, cascading over us like a waterfall. Thank you for the cleansing and refreshing, for your life-giving love and bringing us to birth in Jesus Christ. Advent God, the new broom that sweeps clean, turn our expectations upside down searching for all who are lost and unnoticed. Thank you for those you inspire to spread the gospel in surprising places and in surprising ways. Advent God, travelling towards us at the speed of light, radiant as the sun. Thank you for those who shine your light into the darkness and confusion, reassuring, warming and guiding us. Advent God, running to welcome us with a Father's embrace. Thank you for all who welcome and affirm us, whose strong, loving support reminds us of your everlasting understanding and acceptance, encompassing us everywhere and always, here and now. Advent God, who sees to the heart of the matter with unerring truth and mercy, and knows how easily we are distracted and led astray. Thank you for all our companions on the pilgrimage of faith. May we help and encourage one another, and fix our gaze on all that is good and lovely and right. Prepare us for the coming of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ our Lord. Forgiving God, as we prepare to celebrate your coming amongst us. Yet in many ways we act as though you were an unwelcome guest. You took the trouble to come close, like a child nestled in a woman's arms. Yet the cautious words we used to tell of you keep you at arm's length. We are sorry. Forgive us, Lord. We say you are all-knowing, intimately present in our lives, yet we hide our inner feelings from you as though you were far distant. We are sorry. Forgive us, Lord. We call you Lord and King, yet keep areas of our lives closed to your influence and build barriers of self-interest as though we were defending private territory. We are sorry. Forgive us, Lord. We celebrate the good news of your coming, yet fail to share it with others. We are sorry. Forgive us, Lord. 
Lord, as Advent moves on and Christmas dawns, may we know your closeness, open our lives to you and share your life with others. In our hearts and lives, prepare the way for God. In our homes and workplaces, prepare the way for God. In our life choices and hopes, prepare the way for God. In our friendships and families, prepare the way for God. In our choosing and planning, prepare the way for God. In our joys and our sorrows, prepare the way for God. Prepare the way. Choose. Let go. Make room. For God is close. Salvation is near. Amen. Can we light the Advent candle, please? The Advent candle is there. Casting shadows, spreading light, giving witness in the everyday, telling stories old and new. We remember that we have been asked to leave out our second candle unlit this year to remember the people of Israel and Palestine as Christians in Bethlehem will not light candles this year in the place where Jesus was born. Advent God, shine from us today. When we've encountered God, we have a truth to tell. When we have seen God's light, we have a light to share. Advent God, shine from us today. When our lives seem ordinary and full of faltering steps, God's light still shines and bids us to go and tell. Advent God, shine from us today. We share our very ordinary, our sorrows, joys and faith, and trust that those we share with will glimpse the light of God. Advent God, shine from us today. Advent God, we may feel we are not worthy to share your extraordinary message. We may feel we'll get it wrong. We don't know all the answers. We may feel we do not have the words stumbling to say the right thing. Advent God, as we light our third candle today, shine upon us. Light our path that we may speak and show and tell what you have done for us. Advent God, shine from us today. Amen. We sing hymn number 706, longing for light we wait in darkness, Christ be our light, 706.
I am reading from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 4 and 8 to 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of the righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Amen. The beginning of this passage is familiar to us because it's the scroll Jesus reads in the synagogue at Nazareth. It's sometimes referred to as Jesus' manifesto. Here, the speaker is depicted as an ideal king, inspired by the Spirit of God. We see not just fine visions, moving poetry or religious ecstasy, but a deep commitment to justice. Justice brought particularly to those liable to be victims of injustice. The people's joy at coming home has been tempered by mourning. The city is in ruins. The prophet offers them a message of comfort and hope. God has not abandoned his people. They will rebuild and restore the city, and the nations will see that God is with them. The prophet affirms God's promise of an eternal covenant. Against the backdrop of a wedding feast, He sings a psalm of great joy for all that God has done. Something good lies just around the corner. We can't see it yet, but we know it's good. Excitement is mounting. We thank you for what and who is to come. We thank you for what we have now. You bless us day by day. Even when we're sad, we can praise you. You catch our tears. You turn negatives into positives. You turn our dark times into light and make us laugh again, clothing us in garments of praise. You make the sun shine and the flowers bloom. Something good lies just around the corner. We can't see it yet, but we give thanks, for we know that it's good. Amen. We sing hymn number 171. Hark the glad sound, the Saviour comes, the Saviour promised long.
I'm reading from John 1, verses 19 to 28. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? When he, he confessed and did not deny it, but he confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah or, nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Amen. Getting nearer. Eight sleeps. We never seem to have enough time to get ready for Christmas. But the world took thousands of years. The Old Testament records the activities of the Israelites as they waited. As far as the Jews could remember, as far as their written records went, God had chosen individuals to proclaim his will to the people. The first was Abraham, called by God to leave his family home and set out into an unknown land till he reached God's holy land. A lesser man would have stayed content and comfortable, but Abraham set out in complete faith, not knowing where he was going, at God's command. Moses was the next great man in line. He, reluctantly at first, led the people out of Egypt and through the wilderness into Canaan. But he saw more of God than any man before him and many that followed. And then there was Joshua, Gideon, Samson, Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon, all chosen by God. Then there was the commencement of a line that was to have significance in both Jewish and Christian circles. A line of men who saw what God was saying in the present and looked forward to a future with God. The first great prophet was Elijah, the wild man of the Old Testament, campaigner for God's cause against the prophets of Baal, not afraid to speak against kings like Ahab. Elisha, was his immediate follower. Then those great writing prophets, Isaiah and Micah from the southern kingdom, Amos and Hosea in the north. Jeremiah, a man for whom everything seemed to go wrong, but who still kept true to God. And the prophets of the Babylonian exile, Ezekiel, and that prince of prophets whom ne whose name we shall never know, but who we call second Isaiah, the man who sees more clearly than anyone else what God is like. One or two minor prophets followed, and then in the time of Zechariah, the, the line of prophets seemed to stop. The Jews realized the importance of this line of prophets, and the belief arose that the spirit of prophecy would return to herald in the last days. The prophets who summoned these days took different forms in different circles. Some thought he would be like Moses, a redeemer who works miracles and gives definitive exposition of the Torah, the law. Some 
thought he would be like Elijah, a fiery preacher who announces the imminent coming of the end and urges repentance in preparation for it. It was into this world, waiting for another prophet, one who heralds the day of the Lord, that there came a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. It's no surprise that the people thought John the Baptist was Elijah. Many of them expected Elijah's return, and this man bore an uncanny resemblance to him. If Elijah was the wild man of the Old Testament, then John was the wild man of the New Testament. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather girdle around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. This man was just as they expected, a preacher with an urgent call for repentance. John's ministry was centred in the wilderness, and the people flocked to hear him and be baptised by him. He prepared himself to be the forerunner of Messiah, and he devoted himself to reform. He adopted baptism as a symbol of his reforming activity and a gateway into the messianic regime. But the authorities and the upper classes were not as impressed with the Baptist teaching as the poor people. They sent representatives to him to find out exactly who he was and what he was up to. Priests were sent because both his mother and father were from priestly families. Officially, therefore, John was a priest, but his message and appearance were far from priestly. Pharisees were sent because they dealt with anyone suspected of being a false prophet. No, says John, I am not the Christ, and I am not Elijah. I am the one sent to point you in the right direction. His whole mission is to point the world in the right direction. He has come as a voice in the wilderness, declaring the way of the Lord. He comes bringing baptism as a sign of entry into the kingdom. And eventually, Jesus will come to him for baptism himself, for a sign that the kingdom has come. John and Jesus are very different characters. History says they were related and John may be surprised that his younger cousin is the one who, has, who was sent to, he was sent to announce. Indeed, when he hears how Jesus behaves, he has his doubts. Jesus is not what he expected. But Jesus comes to John for baptism. He needs this symbol that he is entering the kingdom. He needs to know what God has in mind for him. Many people weren't sure about Jesus. He wasn't what they expected. He was born in a stable, not in a palace. He was visited by shepherds and foreigners, not by Jewish royalty and religious representatives. He ate with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. He claimed that the kingdom of God was open to them too. He talked about God in such a new and familiar way. He wanted to affirm the holiness of the whole of life, not just the nice bits. And we see it first in a little baby. We see it in the cold and common straw of a stable. We look into the manger and we see God with a human face, God himself, Emmanuel. We see the child that will become the man who makes God real who shows us what holiness really means. It's very possible that Jesus wanted to be a baptizer like John, but in his time of working out what God wanted from him, a passage from Isaiah emerged. Jesus realized he was not called to bring baptism, baptism as a sign of repentance or to preach God's wrath, but to bring in the kingdom, to make the world God's world to do what God required. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for captives, 
and release from darkness for the, from the, for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. As we continue our countdown to Christmas, as we strain to hear the song of the angels and see the baby in the manger, we are reminded that this is God's call to us too, to walk in his way, to herald in his kingdom, to recognise him when he comes. Amen. We sing hymn number 182. On Jordan's bank, the Baptist cry announces that the Lord is nigh. 182. the only preacher in the Jordan Valley or did he have to compete with other voices there were of course no radio channels broadcasting round the clock no newspapers no mobile phones fax machines email or internet but these were unsettled times with many revolutionary spirits abroad how did those who flocked to John recognize that in this man there was an authentic word from God. There are so many, many voices urging us to do this, to do that, to grasp this opportunity, enjoy that new experience. Help us, Lord, we pray, to distinguish which voices should be heeded and which ignored. Give us the wisdom to recognize among them your voice, your word, however startling the message, whatever the manner of its delivery. We say a prayer as we offer our money and our lives. 
May our gifts of money be used to proclaim the good news of God's love, to bring comfort to the sick and bereaved, to call people to repentance and faith through the work of this church and the church in all the world and in the name of the Lord who came in power. Amen. And we bring our prayers for the world. When I say the words, Advent God, will you please respond, hear our prayer. Advent God, hear our prayer. <coughs> Almighty God, we bring our prayers and the concerns of our hearts to you. Our prayers for those around us, those we love and care for, those we hear of first or second hand, those whose situations cause us pain, anguish and distress. As Advent preparations gather pace and thoughts turn to celebrating the birth of Jesus, we pray for those who are unaware of what Christmas is all about, for those who know nothing of your nativity, for those who do know you and strive to follow you, but feel overwhelmed by all that's going on around them and find it hard to share the joy we have in you. Advent God, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are uncertain of themselves, of their worth, their direction in life and purpose. For those who think they have nothing to offer to anyone, for those who think they are far more important than they are. For those who inflate their own importance to the neglect of what is right, loving and caring to those around them. Advent God, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are laid low with illness, physical or mental, who can see no improvement nor path to better health. For those who await tests and operations, fearful of the outcome and their future prospects. For those who are dying and know that death is near, may they know care, love and support and may they feel enveloped in a peace beyond understanding. Advent God, hear our prayer. We pray for those countries embroiled in war and violence, for those for whom Christmas will come and go with violence, injury and death all around them. For those who have no home, safety or security. We pray especially for those living in the Holy Land, which seems so far from that as we look on and feel their pain. We remember too Ukraine and the violence meted out by the Russian regime and so many other war-torn countries. Advent God, hear our prayer. We pray for the leaders of the nations who met at the COP28 climate change conference. May they act on the agreements they made 
and may they and we, the world in all its fullness, engage with the reality of global warming and the danger to life in all its forms. Advent God, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are re-experiencing pain and anguish as a result of the COVID inquiry and all the questions, answers and confusions that we hear daily. For those who have tried to move on in life post-COVID, after illness and the death of family and friends, for all those involved in decision-making and in caring, and now in investigating and probing. May there be honesty, transparency, care and concern for all involved. Advent God, hear our prayer. We pray for those who will work over Christmas to keep us safe and cared for. Those who will work to keep the shops open to meet our needs. Who will drive vans loaded with cards and parcels to bring us gifts and news of friends near and far. We pray for those who will work to keep our electricity flowing, our gas pumps and water flowing from our taps. Advent God, hear our prayer. We pray for all those we will meet and share with this coming week, that they may see through us the light of Christ, that they may feel your love and presence through us. May love, joy, hope, peace, life and light be shared amongst us. Advent God, Hear our prayer. We bring these and all the unspoken prayers on our minds and in our hearts together as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn is number 330. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Three, three. Oh.
God of joy, your love reaches out to those who are sad. Your words encourage us to care for the poor. Your inspiration challenges us to face up to the wrong in our world. Make us strong to do your work and give us the joy that comes from knowing you. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.